This is News from Heaven. Today we're going to hear evil spirits explain why they like hell. If you, you can't do the God thing without sorting out the heaven and hell thing. Elephant in the room. If you're going to say, oh, God's so great. God loves everyone. This is so loving that I'm thinking about God. But you're talking about a place of eternal happiness and then a place of eternal misery. It just doesn't square with ethics. It doesn't square with rationality. What? How could you possibly say that something like a heaven and hell could be the product of a loving system? Well, who better to advocate for this system than people who are in hell? Okay, let's do it, because we got to sort this out. If the idea that God is there and that you can separate positive and negative things is the key to getting us out of everything that plagues us in life, because if you just said everything's just great in its current situation, then there's no hope for change. But if there really is this difference between this yellow marker and the clouds of the mind, what is it and and what does that separation look like and how do we find ourselves in one of these two camps? It's really, it's not, okay, how do I get to yellow? It's which do I want, you know, right? This is from Swedenborg's Divine Providence number 340. And it begins with some nice little ornaments. Download the book for free in the description if you want. And here you see this is the very, very last thing that appears in this book. It's 340 subsection 6. And this is how it starts. Forgive me for adding the following to fill out the rest of the page. Look, I'm sorry. I didn't want to have to print this. But I do. And to fill out the rest of the page... I could, let's just display my ignorance of history here. I believe this actually was a bigger deal to make sure you got a full printing on a page back then. So there was a, this was a standard kind of reason here. So what is he going to fill out the rest of the pages? We already talked about divinity and the belief in instant salvation is causing problems in the church and it's a fiery serpent. We've got our theological salvo taken care of. What's this? What are we tacking on to the end here? And how is this going to help us? sort out the whole heaven and hell thing. By special permission, some spirits came up from hell and said to me, hey, you've written a great deal that the Lord has given you. Write something from us as well. So, right there, there's something surprising. Because look, these are these spirits that are in hell. Isn't the pr- hell this thing that makes us doubt whether you that the whole god thing is accurate because it just seems like how could you ever have a place where people are miserable and how could a loving god allow that so but wouldn't the first thing that these spirits say they came up from hell wouldn't they say help us or we're sorry or just tell god to give us a second chance what the first thing they say is wait let us tell our side of the story. And this is Swedenborg. Is he going to say, no, I would never let an evil spirit talk and get, get put in to a book that I'm trying to publish and get out to the world. Okay. What should I write? They said, and this is key to understanding heaven and hell as the core of them is not place, it's psychology. And what the difference in those two uh, psychological orientations is. They said, Write that every spirit, whether good or evil, has his or her own delight. A delight in goodness for the good, and a delight in evil for the evil. That's actually a great summary of what heaven and hell are. Everything is motivated by joy. That the essence of our thrust in life is we're pursuing something that we think will make us feel happy, something that we want. And they're saying, look, yeah, not that heaven and hell is this great chasm and on one side there is happiness and the other is bleak nothingness and suffering. They're saying, look, we all have our own delight. The difference is for good people, what's the difference between a good and a bad person, you're good when you enjoy to do things that are good, and evil when you enjoy to do things 
that are evil. Okay? So what, what are we talking about? We're talking about things that are good versus things that are evil. I asked, being Swedenborg, what's your delight? They said that it was a delight in adultery, theft, fraud, and lying. Okay, so yeah, bad stuff. And that stuff, why is that, there's so much of that kind of stuff going on? Everybody knows you don't want to get fraudulent fraudulated it, you know there's all these you, there's all these phone scams where they're calling you or they're particularly calling people who are not very savvy about that sort of thing and setting people up and you hear that oh my my grandmother got tricked by one of these and gave up this sort of thing it's terrible everybody knows it's underhanded nobody's saying this is what a good idea go out and do it why is that stuff rampant in the world sure some people are doing it to survive, but there's also very much a delight in the power that comes from that and in the cruelty in whatever form. Why, why lying? Why theft? And for, particularly, you can get to a point where I, something, I, I just want to steal. I don't even need the thing, but I just got to steal. So this stuff, all of it has joy attached to it. Even let, take it down into the little stuff that we do all the time, which is y yelling at somebody. Or <laughs> do we do that all the time? What I mean is, uh, I want to get the last word in, right? Or I want to, somebody's cut me off and I want to honk at them, something like that. There is a joy in getting revenge, and even in those micro little ways. There's a joy in all this negative stuff, or there can be, and some people are more predisposed to get it from different things. There's a delight in it. It's not just utilitarian. It's sometimes it's an end in itself. I went on to ask, what are these delights like? So what's it like if you're in hell and you love that stuff? They said that others experience them as stenches from excrement, foul odors from corpses, and the reek of stale urine. So that's about the weirdest follow-up statement you can have. And I'm going to address that, but let's just read the next sentence first. And I said, and do you find them pleasant? They said that they were absolutely delightful. Okay. So the reason why we have this very bizarre response to this question, what are these delights like? This whole thing here, stenches from excrement, foul odors from corpses, the reek of stale urine. This is a feature of the spiritual world that things there that are are represented by sensible tangible things so i try to put this in some kind of perspective so here you can hear about somebody doing something that's really underhanded and really just abominable think of whatever it is for in particular for you that you've looked in the news and seen this thing happen and you're just aghast that somebody would do that the actual thing itself, you know, it should be grosser than it is in the way that it, it happens or is portrayed or something. When you want to just, like, what would be a good representation of how abhorrent that thing is? You have on one hand, these really abhorrent things that have moral implications to them. Then on the other hand, you have stuff that's super gross, just viscerally gross. This would be things like excrement, corpses, urine. And they're not necessarily, though on the same spectrum. I mean, there's, there's nothing morally wrong with excrement. It's there. But the reason that stuff is so gross is it corresponds to evil. And when you get into the spiritual world, stuff that is evil is actually portrayed or exists as this grossest stuff. I'm, man, when I set out to explain this, I was like, I'm going to wrap this up so neatly. It's going to make total sense. I don't think we're there, but I just think that's about as close as we're going to get. But there is something satisfying to me in the idea of you take this grossness that exists away from any morality and then this mor moral grossness, that the two, the two belong. Like that, that is just gross. And I said, do you find them pleasant? And they said that they were absolutely delightful. So that's what hell is. There's stuff that is not just weird. Sometimes we can just say, well, I like this thing, but, you know, like, let's say there's, I saw this thing on TV once of these people who like to put pee on their skin. This is true. To, you know, they, they like it. Um, and I can say, like, well, there's something that's not good about that, but I don't, I don't know all the science. Like, is that, is that really bad or is it just 
I'm not used to it or what, but the stuff that corresponds to gross stuff is actually bad. And the, the hell thing is diving into stuff that everybody else knows this is morally wrong, and then it appears like that. This is much harder to explain than I thought. Blah. Then I said, okay, what does, what does Swedenborg say when he finds out that these spirits are saying, well, we love diving into this stuff that's, that we know is gross, but we love it. Then you're like filthy beasts that live in substances like these. And they said, okay, if we are, we are, but to our nostrils, these scents are delightful. So they're essentially pitching Swedenborg on hell. They're saying, look, this, we love this stuff. This stuff that is evil and harmful and abrasive and destructive, it just feels great to us. And we don't care. We don't care what you think. We love it. Okay? I asked, what else do you want me to write? They said, write this. That, and this, I think, gets into why it's not necessarily a good idea to choose hell. Write this. We are allowed to live in our own delights. This is God. Everybody can live in their own delights. No matter how filthy they are, as some would say, as long as we do not harass good spirits and angels. But since we cannot help harassing them, we are driven off and cast into hell, where we suffer terribly. So, there you have this explanation of, of the hell state, which is, you love things that you just can't have everybody doing. You just can't. If it's stuff like murder and assault and everything else that we try to expunge as a society, you just can't have somebody who's going to do that around people. And you could say, look, you, whatever you want to do to try to make yourself happy, but when you cross the line and start doing that to us, we can't have you here. So, but when you're caught up in the passions for that stuff, it's not... Um, it's not constructive. It doesn't have, it's not reasonably satiated. You just want more and more. And so you get to this point where you can't, you know, okay, I just can't cross this line, but I just can't help it. That's when you have some kind of, and you don't even say like, what, what is the suffering here? Is it not you know, withdrawals from this sort of stuff? That is the nature of hell. That actually hell is God trying to allow you with whatever you've chosen to devote your life to. And that's what, that's what life here is, is that we have things that appeal to us and we try to rationally make decisions. Now, it's a great time to stop and say, you can easily get on your soapbox and say, well, look at this person has, has an affection for something that's, that I think is evil and that's messed up that they do it. But context, you don't know, like if, if somebody has much more difficult circumstances and also like an inclination to that stuff that you don't have, you don't, you can't get around, go around saying, well, this person is better or worse than this one. We don't know. Only God knows that. And really there's not, it's not the, there's not really a moral game anyway, because according to Swedenborg, all the impulses for good and truth are coming out of God and the, the impulses to shut them out are coming out of hell. So we play a part. But the point of all this is you can't go around and say, look, this person is evil and I'm good because you don't know that. And that's not the point. Nobody's actually evil. People are deceived by evil and tricked by the allure of it into this kind of life. And because of the uh, ability, the constant ability that God has given all of us to choose what we want to do, you know, you, God can't pry you out of there if you're saying this is what I want to do. But it's really everybody who's caught up in this stuff, if they, if they really wanted to understand the big picture, you know, shouldn't have chosen it. And and so the attitude that Swedenborg describes coming from angels and God all the time is not like, well, you failed the test. It's like, oh, man, I wish that we could convince you otherwise. And, you know, we hold the keys to that. But worth noting that it's not like a revenge thing. And But also another interesting piece here is like, sorry for that vocal filler, we can't help harassing people. And this is an insight into, oh, why good people? That there's a certain, there's a certain like rage at order when you love disorder. I said, why do you harass good people? They answered that they couldn't help it. It was as though a rage came over them when they saw angels and sensed the divine aura around them. 
And that's just so it's, there's not much knowledge at the point of contact, but it makes me think of the, the senseless destruction we sometimes see. And why is it that there's an urge to that? Why do people want to hurt children? There's something in us, I think, that if you scaled it all the way back, the divine thing is that if you're choosing disorder, and it's not even you at the time, it's hell that's moving into you, whatever, you're choosing that disorder, there is a, an, a, an aversion to order, and that people who are in these good states represent God achieving that order. At the essence of it, it's a hatred of divine order, which is divine love, which is God. But they, they don't seem to be very aware of that. They answered that they couldn't help it. It was as though a rage came over them when they saw angels and sensed the divine aura around them. Swedenborg says, this makes you like wild animals. When they heard this, a rage came over them that looked like blazing hatred, and to prevent them from doing any harm, they were taken back to hell. There we go. Why does hell exist? Well, why, why do we do anything in society to try to keep those who would intentionally harm away from other people? That's why hell is there, to prevent them from doing any harm. And allowing, and what's not stated explicitly there, is allowing you to have as much pleasure as you can possibly have in your life without doing harm or doing as little harm as possible. And yeah, maybe Swedenborg gets a barb in there that they get some, you know, maybe he's a bit complicit in that. But the overall picture is, look, you just can't have these spirits out in the population doesn't mean, you know, we're not trying to let them be as happy as they can. Doesn't mean that there isn't things in hell that bring them joy, but you just can't, you just can't go around doing that to people, even if you want to. And don't we want to instead investigate, why do we want to do that stuff? Is that really where I want to invest? Is in this, just because it feels good initially, is it really the right life investment? On the way, pleasure, oh, right, right, right. On the way pleasures are sensed as odors and the stenches in the spiritual world, C 303, 305, and 324 above. Okay, the thing I struggled with most in this episode, trying to explain that weird stale urine part. There, go read it there. You'll find out everything I was going to say. The end. So, it's kind of satisfying, because we never come to actually the end of a book in one of these. To summarize it, heaven and hell are the divine creating the ideal space for you, no matter what you love. So if we choose to love what is harmful to people, that severely limits the amount of freedom that we can have, just because why should other people have to be harmed because of our choices? Somebody else cultivates a lifestyle and a reason for being that includes consuming you in some way to feel for them to feel good. Okay. That's where they are, but but why why do I have to be a, a pawn in their life? That, that doesn't I don't want to do that. So that pulls us down. The cool thing about being about goodness and about love and about constructive activity is that it is something that is applicable to the whole human race. That the the more you participate in it, the better everything gets. And it's something you can be proud of, that, that if you represented it in physical form, it wouldn't be represented as stale urine. This is the record for the most time that I think I've ever said urine in an episode of this show. Hopefully the kids are miles away from the screen before you even turn this show on. That is something that seems beautiful and is beautiful, and that's what heaven is. So, hell is not, it's not actually God has one feeling towards good people and one feeling towards people who are involved in evil. It's the same feeling, which is, let me get you to the place where you're, based on what you love and what you're choosing, let me get you to the place where you can be happiest. And w- with the, I guess you could add a sub-rule, which is, you can't go around har- taking other people's happiness to add to yours. You just don't have that. W- why would you get that privilege? Uh, s- says who? So that is, this, that is the picture here. To me, it's a good start of a conversation of, okay, why is there heaven and hell? And that's the, the news from heaven. Let me know. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are and where we can go from this. And, how, and more importantly, how does this, rather than we think about other people and what they're doing, how does this help us sort through our own thoughts and feelings? Because there's a miniature heaven and a miniature hell in us. Does this give us the tools to climb through that with more agency and more efficiency and hopefully get us into these heavenly states of mind that are good and true? Leave a comment. Check it out. Thanks for watching. 
and I will talk to you very soon.